I will praise you, O Lord of my heart. I will tell of your wonders on earth. I'll be glad and rejoice in your life. Sing praise to your name, O Most High. In this series on the book of Colossians called Walking in a Manner Worthy of the Lord, and we use it in conjunction with our yearly series of being spiritful. Because being spiritful is not just about being spiritful, it's about living the spiritful life. And Colossians has a lot to do with how you live when you are spiritual. Um, last time we spoke about the power of the gospel. The fact that this very basic message changes the world. It changed the Colossians. And we had some kids here last time who explained on their five fingers for us the gospel. And I'm going to ask who of you will be brave enough to come stand here and give me the five finger representation of the gospel. I'm not going to ask the, the regular evangelists in our church. They do that enough. I want to ask something and you mustn't take offense. If you're too scared to do it in front of believers, will you do it in front of unbelievers? Thank you, Brian. First finger, the thumb. Obviously God is good. It's His universe. He made the rules. Uh, the second finger is the finger that points at you. Uh, take your mother pointing at you, saying you've done something wrong. And basically just says that we've all fallen short of God's plan and who God is. So He cannot allow us into His presence. And if we look then at the third finger, that then represents the cross. The third finger just represents the cross, which is Jesus paying the price to get, for us to be able to get back to Him. The fourth finger is the ring finger, which speaks of all the promises that God has for us. Uh, promises for good, not for evil. And the last finger, the, pink, the little pinky, are the promises that God has for us. Yes. The first one is the commitment we must make. Commitment. <laughs> <laughs> commitment and then the promises. Oh. And the pinky finger. Well there we go. Perfect. I, re I really want to say it again. I don't want to offend you, but you can't judge what God desires of you by what you've heard in church your whole life, if it was wrong. If your church that you grew up in never said, hey, you must tell people the gospel, they were wrong. They were sinners. God calls all children of God to, to witness to the gospel. Now I must add, not everyone is called to do it in front of a group. I know some of you would gladly do it in one person, but the idea of standing here is a bit much, and that is fine. We are not all called to spread the Gospels to group. But you need to be able, that's a command from God, to spread the good news. That's the biggest command of God. Every other command comes from love God, love the neighbors, spread the Gospel. That's the big three. And so we really want to encourage you, get familiar with it. Um, it is so important. I was spoken, speaking to friends of us again this weekend. who was in a certain church for many years. And they've moved now to a church that is far more biblical. And they said... You know what? For years we never heard about sin. For years we never heard about repentance. The modern gospel is fluffy. The modern gospel is, oh, you're so great. And because you're so fantastic, Jesus died for you so you can go to heaven. Aren't you a lucky guy? No, you are horrible, terrible, and I'm including myself there. We are born in the kingdom of darkness. And we have to accept the good news. We have to repent. We have to fall on our knees and not take forgiveness. Beg for forgiveness. Not take eternal life, plead for eternal life. He is not stingy in holding it back. He gives it to those who ask. But He gives it to those who give their whole life in asking. So, I want to encourage you, get familiar. There are still booklets there at the back. This method and other methods of telling the gospel. And I want to thank Brian for his bravery to come and stand here. Um, the gospel is good, God's good news. And it's to find its fulfillment in the future. Definitely, the greatest fulfillment of the gospel is when it comes again. But it doesn't only start in the future. 
The greatness of the gospel starts for today. God is here. He's changing. He's working. He's, and, and that's what the spiritual life is about. And, and so you must understand how we get these together. The spiritual life is just living the fullness of what the gospel offers us. That's what it is. The gospel offers us access to God. The gospel offers us freedom to be in His presence, to be filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit-filled life is grabbing the gospel with both your hands and making it real for yourself. And so we're going to carry on today there in Colossians. So you can open your Bibles to Colossians 1. We are going to read from verse 3 to verse 8 of Colossians 1. From verse 3 to verse 8. Yes, Father, I really want to pray that you will wake us up. We are so asleep. We are so stuck in our ways. Wake us up through the power of the Spirit so that we know the end is coming. The end is coming. We firstly need to be ready for ourselves, but we need to go and warn the world. We need to warn the world that there is no hope in anything else than in Christ. Your hope cannot be in your atomic bombs or your military power or your big bank account. Our hope is in Christ. And so Lord, fire us up with your Spirit. Make us new. Make us instruments in your hand. We pray this all in your wonderful name. Amen. Colossians 1, verses 3 to 8. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Today we want to focus there on verse 7 and verse 8 that says, Just as you learned it, it being the gospel from Epaphras, that's a better pronunciation that Carol gave us, um, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf or our behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so today we're talking about the effect of the Gospel. Last time we spoke about the power of the Gospel. We did touch on the effect, but the power of the, the idea that it changes, it moves, it spreads, it grows. It doesn't stop at racial barriers. It doesn't stop at cultural barriers. It's the good news for the whole world. And today we're carrying on a bit deeper on this idea of the effect of the Gospel. Now the first guy we want to look at when we do this is this guy called Epaphras. And he was both their missionary and their pastor. In our first sermon we said he was a guy that lived in Colossa and he went to Ephesians and he heard Paul preach the gospel there. And he was changed in so much that he went back home and he started telling the people around him. And the result was that the church was planted by Epaphras. He's the guy that started this church. He's the guy that taught them the gospel. Um, and he, we will read that he worked very hard for them. Colossians 4, 12 and 13 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. So this time when Paul is writing to the Colossians, Epaphras is with him. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea, in Hierapolis. And so eventually... Later on, Epaphras ends up with Paul in prison. And we read in Philemon 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus sends greetings to you. I always love to, to hear the stories of people like this. People who are just doing their thing. He was most probably just in Eph Ephesus for business. And he is changed by the gospel. And his whole life changes. He suddenly stops doing what he does. And he becomes a missionary to his hometown. He goes back, and many of you would know, and the Bible warns us, one of the most difficult places to go be a missionary is where you grew up. Because those people knew your previous nonsense. And then he goes back, and he tells the gospel to them. 
and they get saved, and they get changed. And they're not even Jews, they are Gentiles. And they get saved and they get changed. Um, so I want to ask you this question today, you really have to think about. Who were the people that brought the gospel to you? And, and I always thought it would be one. When I was younger, I thought there must be a guy. But it's often not a guy. It's often three guys and five girls, or something like that. Ladies that, that over a period of time brought the gospel to you until it clicked. Until it fell. So who, do you know who it was that really made an effort, who worked hard for you? Another way, if you want to be strengthened um, in your walk, go and read the biographies or the autobiographies of guys like this who gave their life. Now, I, a couple of years back, read through the biography of Andrew Murray, which was phenomenal. I mean, to go read that. There's another book, especially if you're a bit younger, but not just if you're younger, but that's a book, uh, No Compromise, by Keith Green. It's a thick book like this, man, and it's going to change your life. Now, this guy, who was a rocker, he was an artist, he was out there, he was making worldly music. And God saved him radically, and how he lived this life of no compromise. But, but back to the people... Who taught the gospel to you? I'm going to give you two, two pieces of homework today. And the first piece of homework is this. Contact them and thank them. Now for some of you, you will have to, they are not with us anymore. They are now with the Lord. So you can't contact them and thank them. But maybe their spouse or their children are still alive. And make some effort. Can you imagine if someone is down in the dumps? Thinking, and suddenly someone contacts him and says, you know, your mom or your dad changed my life. And so, go and do some effort. Go think first. Who were the people? Who, who was my Epaphras? Who was the guy who taught the gospel to me? Who was the guy or the lady? I say guy, but obviously I mean guy or lady who made hard work to bring the gospel to me. And go, we've got Facebook, we've got all these books. You can go find them and go thank them, them or their family, and give them some encouragement. Now I'm going to ask, very briefly, is there anybody who would like to give a brief testimony of the person or persons who taught the gospel to you? Now's your moment. I'd like to. Okay, I'm going to bring the microphone to you. Now we have a moving microphone, it's very easy. Well, I was a very young girl, it's, I think I was seven years of, old, of age, and my mother had led my sister to the Lord. And then she came and led me to the Lord. I had a wonderful mother and father who loved the Lord, and she was involved in child evangelism, and I was a child then. <laughs> and praise the Lord, He has kept me through these years. Okay. Anyone else? I can come to you. There we go. Sandy, thank you. You want to come to the front?
was it had a huge impact in my life. I wondered how on earth God could um, work in that man's life the way he did, and I really wanted that. So when we came to South Africa and the Gideons visited at our school, I was there. I said, Lord, here I am. Please take my life. And um, it was a rocky walk until um, later on in high school, I had a friend who went to a Christian church and her parents, even up until I got married, they would fetch me every Sunday morning and evening and take me to church. And so it was really a commitment from their side. They, they drove kilometers and kilometers for my sake, but the Lord is good. And yeah, I'm very thankful for what he did. Thank you. One more. There's always time for one more test. Thank you. Um, there are many people who influenced me coming to know the Lord. <clears throat> in coming to know the Lord, but the greatest influence and the final nail in my coffin was my wife. <clears throat> She never ever preached the gospel to me that I can remember as a, some sort of a thing. But what she did was she repaid evil with good until I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and that was the reason I came. And I thank her for that. Thank you, my darling. I, I think it's so sad if you are stuck in a, in a Christian tradition where it's never been about being born again, where it's never been about being made new. It must be frustrating because it's just about the rules. It's just about the system. It's just about what's required of you. And it's so wonderful to hear that God, through all these various means, He has His ways, reach people and save them. And that is the power of the gospel. So I hope you are able to find your Epaphras or family members and thank them. So. Now the next thing is, we, we spoke about the fact that last week we said the gospel was bearing fruit and increasing. Um, and here he's expanding a bit on what he means by the fact that it was bearing fruit. Where he says there, and, it has made to you, and he has made known to us your love in the spirit. So what he's saying is that the way we could see that the gospel really got a hold of you was the way you loved. Now, again, if you're a nominal Christian, that's irrelevant for you. You don't care how you treat people and how you treat other people. It's just your choice. It's about me. But if the gospel really grabs hold of you, you change. You get off your throne where it's all about me. And you become a servant of others. And you become a servant of God. And this idea of the love in the spirit, um, we've said before, it's not worldly love. Worldly love is when you love everyone that loves you, or you love everyone that's lovable, or everyone that deserves to be loved. Godly love is like Bruce now said, when you go and you get evil and you give love. And you get evil and you give love. At our prayer meeting just before, we've mentioned some of the stories that's coming out of the Ukraine and Russia now, where the Ukrainians are repaying evil with good. And how it's changing people. How it's changing Russian soldiers, how it's changing Ukrainians even. But this idea of the love in the Spirit is actually basically a summary of all the fruit of the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit starts with love. So he's saying, we know that the Gospel got hold of you because we can see the fruit of the Spirit growing in you. And that is the goal. That is what churches should be known for. The fact that we are kind and patient and we have self-control and we have love but why don't we often see that why don't we often see it on wednesday we watched a, a short clip about the welsh revival and the guy that was quite central in this revival was a guy called evan roberts and one of his prayers that led to revival was this for a long long time i was much troubled in my soul and my heart by thinking over the failure of christianity oh it seemed such a failure such a failure, and I prayed and prayed, but nothing seemed to give me relief. Why, why would he call Christianity a failure? 
Because he looks at the people who call themselves Christians and they are exactly like the people who do not call themselves Christians. And he's saying, what was the point? What was the point for Jesus to die? What was the point for these missionaries to give their lives for the gospel if nothing happens? You know, the problem is, most people think Christianity is something that you add to your life and they don't realize it's something you give your life to. Christianity is not a little club you add to your life um, it's something you give your life to. You take up your cross and you follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. Now the good news for Everett Roberts is that God answered his prayer. And wells got changed. People got saved. People got changed. They weren't like the world anymore. They were different. They were holy. They were God honoring. They were loving to their neighbors. But... Um, we need to realize today, and I've said this now many times, half of Christianity is a terrible Christianity. By half of Christianity, I mean, if you're just here, you're just part of the crowd, you like the people, many of them, some you don't like at all, um, but you like the tea is relatively good, and every now and then they sing a song you like, and you complain about the songs you don't like, and the preachers are okay most of the time. Um, that's half of Christianity. You're just here for the club. It's actually still about you. Now, nothing in the world where it's half is it good. I mean, if you drink half your antibiotics, what happens? Do you feel better if you drink half your antibiotics? Yes. Of course, yes. That's why people stop drinking their antibiotics. But what are you doing if you drink half your antibiotics? You are breeding drug-resistant um, bugs. That's what you're doing. So you, a lot of people come with Christianity. They just do it because it makes them feel a bit better. But they stop before it gets to the place where it changes them, where it kills the sin in them, where it deroots the evil in them. Now, half a training for a race, is that a good thing? I did this once. I rode the Argus and I trained half for the Argus. It was a very bad idea. Why is that even worse than not training at all? Because if you don't train, you don't go. And you think, there's no chance. I never trained. But half training gives you this fake Bravado. Now, man, I did one 30 kilometer trip on my bicycle. I should be fine for 100 kilometers. Um, no, it doesn't work like that. If there's a hole and I'm able to jump 75% over that hole, does it make any difference? I still fall down the hole. And the, the message here in Colossians is guys, grab the gospel, let it change you. Stop running after half the gospel. Um, the, the problem also about this half of Christianity is that, like I said, it leads to so much guilt. Because you know the rules. You know the result of disobeying the rules, but you have no motivation to obey the rules. You know God says, live a holy life. You know there are consequences of not living a holy life, but you have no motivation to stop the way that you are living. And you suffer the consequences. Half of Christianity leads to hypocrisy. Because you think, well, I'm still half better than most of the world, so I must be something. I'm half better than those who don't call themselves Christians. It leads to self-righteousness and judgmentalism. How does God feel about half Christianity? Revel Revelation tells us, I know your works. God knows you. Nothing you have here that you do or think that's hidden from Him. I know your works. You are neither hot, cold, nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now listen to this next one, which we don't often read with it. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Half of Christianity leaves you wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and and naked. So here's the invite for today. Give it all over to God. Take a walk through your life and see which areas of your life are you holding back and surrender it to Him. And if you're stuck, you're trying to surrender but you can't, go find help, go get someone to pray for you. So I'm going to invite you now to walk through your heart. So you must imagine now, we're walking through your house but it represents your life. Now you open at the door. And you must realize that God always knocks on that door. And you have first have question you have to ask is, does God always have access to my life? Or does He have access uh, in the mornings before 10? 
um, Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings, but preferably not Saturday afternoons and evenings. Does God have access to your life at all times? Then you come into the entrance hall. Now, what is the entrance hall used for? Most houses don't even have entrance halls. That was the first impression. That's where you had all the beautiful things and your walking sticks and this is who we are. This is what we do. Here's a pretty picture of a very old dead grandfather. And that's, that was gives the image of what you will find in the rest of the house. Now, for many people, they have these areas in their home where people move, but the rest are like closed doors. And you don't dare open that door because then it looks like a storm hit there. So what are they doing? They're living a false image. They're living with a mask. This is what I show the world, but this is what's really going on in the background. Now, is that you today? The, the you we see here today is not you. It's not you. This is the you you present to us on a Sunday morning. Surrender it all to God. Then we walk down the entrance hall, through the corridor, and we get to the kitchen. And now one of the first questions is, food your idol? Do you run to food when you are sad, lonely? And the next question is, are you hospitable? Is your life open to others? Or is it my choice when I decide when people will see me? And then, then you walk on and you get into the TV room. And you have to ask yourself, what am I pouring into my life and into my, through my mind and through my eyes and through my ears? Am I filling myself with the goodness of God? Or do I constantly throw the world into me and then I wonder why I'm so worldly? Then we walk onto the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you see your face is dirty. And what do you do about it? There's that passage that says some people look in the mirror and they see their face is dirty and, and they walk away and they forget about it. To go stand in front of that mirror and say, God, this in my life must change. These things in my life can't go on. Then you move on to the children's bedroom. How's your relationship with your family and your church family? How's, how are you a blessing to others? Then you walk down the corridor and you open the cupboards and everything falls out because you have three of everything. Possessions. How's your relationship with your possessions? Is your possessions controlling you or is God controlling you? Now, a week ago we had a meeting with all the various places like Eistelba and Jakobus in town to talk about the, the ministry to the elderly in town. And someone there commented and said, one of their big frustrations is that people cannot look after themselves anymore. And so they have to move to a place where, because they can't afford 20,000 rand for someone to look after them at their house if you want 24-hour care. So they have to move to the old age home and sell their homes, but they refuse. So they don't have money to go to the old age home, but the house stands there for no one ever to live in except the, maybe the family once a week in December. And we cling to these worldly things and we suffer for it, but we cling because it's mine. It's mine. How dare you suggest I let go of this? And then you walk onto your own bedroom. Do you keep the marriage bed pure? Which physical or mental ways do you defile God's goodness that He created? So I want to invite you again. That's your second part of homework for this week. Go walk through your life and see Am I half a Christian because I have all these rooms that I don't allow God into? All these rooms that's like, no God, you can have this side, but not this side. Um, take Him there. Open up all the doors. Give it all over to Him. And then you are ready for the fullness of God. You can't expect the Holy Spirit to fill your house if you don't want to even open the door for and Then you can be changed from the inside out. So in conclusion, don't let the devil trick you into half a gospel, half a commitment. You will lack all the goodness of the gospel. And just a reminder, your two pieces of homework, go find your Epaphras or your Epaphras family and walk through the heart of your house, your life, and ask, is God the King of all? Have I been changed completely because I've given over completely? Let's pray. Yes, Father, thank you that your gospel brings glory to you, but is good to us as well. When we stop being fake Christians, Christians on the outside, Christians with a mask, when we really step into that throne room and, and lay ourselves on the altar as living sacrifices, that's when the real life begins. 
That's when the joy hits. That's when the peace hits. That's when the patience hits. That's when all those fruit of the Spirit, the love and everything, become a growing part of our lives because we do not live for self anymore, but we live for you. And Lord, I want to pray for our church today. Thank you that you are here. Thank you that you do not sit far away and we have to go look for you. You are here calling. You are here knocking on that door. Lord, we so often use that passage in, for evangelism, but it's not written to unbelievers. It's written to believers that God is knocking at the doors of their hearts and saying, let me in. And so Lord, help us. Show us where we need to open a door, where we need to let go, where we need to give over and make you the King of all. So we pray, Lord, for all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. I will praise you, O Lord of my heart. I will tell of your wonders on earth. I'll be glad and rejoice in your life. Sing praise to your name, O Most High.